You just, I don't dare, friends, I don't dare get my mind in there and try to figure out how things are going to work. I mean, I don't sit at home and try to figure out who's got a job or who doesn't have a job. You know? <laughs> never enters my mind. It never, never enters my mind. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God, and he said he'll supply all your material needs. If God had any worries, which he doesn't, the least of them would be to supply your material needs. That, that would be the least of them. If he had any worries or concerns at all. Uh, I just got a uh, large order of books in. Like I told you before, I just order hundreds and hundreds of books, and those things are expensive. And that's really what we spend all of our money on. It all goes to books, seeking first the kingdom. And I got, actually got a letter from the president of the company that I order my books from saying, we just can't believe how many books you order from us. And this is an international discount book center here, and they wrote me a letter back said that you are our very best customer that we have. <laughs> I just, I had sent off a $200 order here several weeks ago and got that back in, and along with that uh, comes a note. And I just said, praise God, that's the honor that he gives us, and that's, that's the blessing that he gives us whenever we uh, make the quality of decision to set our seal that God is true to his word that he's faithful to his word, and if we seek first the kingdom, then he'll supply all of our needs. And people are, sometimes ask us, we've got relatives that a lot of times ask us, how much money do you have in the bank account? And uh, we've told them before, $4 or $10. One time we had $3. That was the lowest we ever got. We had $3. But uh, we didn't have any bills that weren't paid, though. <laughs> I mean, that's the blessing about it. And, of course, I always get to tell them and rub it in some. We don't waste money on doctors and insurance and all these things. We save a small fortune just trusting God totally. I'll tell you what, if you had to pay doctor bills and bills to have babies in the hospital, uh, I'd see why you'd be as poor as a church mouse. Because you'd be in debt so far, I mean, you'd never get out. Praise God. So we always want to give God glory for what he does. He's the one who does it. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, you see, this is what he does with David. David wandering, wandering, wandering. Nothing belongs to him. He doesn't own anything. But then when it's time, you see, there's a time, there's always a time whenever you have proved your faithfulness to God that if he never gave you anything, you'd still serve him. That's what he's always looking for. These get-rich quick schemes that so many charismatics are teaching are just foreign to the old end of the New Testament. He wants to see your faithfulness in serving him, that you're not serving him for the gold and the glory and the glitter, but you're serving him because he has put a calling upon your life to do that very thing. And I'll tell you what, friends, whenever he sees your faithfulness, then uh, you just won't be able to stop the blessings there. He's the one that said in Philippians 4.19 that he supplies not according to how many mouths at the table there are to feed, not according to how big or small the need is, but according to his riches in glory. Sometimes the need may be small, but he may supply big. Because he's not giving according to the size of your need. He is giving according to the size of his riches and glory. And that's no contradiction to say that you can have $3 to your name, but not owe anyone anything, have a, a house full of, just full of everything. Uh, you don't even need anything. If you ask me what, you, what should you get me for my birthday next month, which please don't, uh, I can. I have to tell you nothing. I don't need anything. <laughs> if you gave it to me, I'd have two of it then, probably. <laughs> well, we're getting into the prosperity teaching here in First Samuel. But what does David get? Well, he owns the whole world of his day when he becomes king. But not for twenty years, though. Why he proves his faithfulness? and his diligence to serve God, and then whenever it's time for him to be king, then it's time, and there won't be anybody or anything or any devil that can stop the blessings of God from coming upon you. 
if you'll remain faithful in your walk and diligent in your serving and, and consecration and, and dedication to the Lord. Because he's the one that said that he would supply him according to his riches and glory and that he'd give you a hundredfold back in this life if he'd see you surrender them up for the gospel's sake. And if you don't know what to do with your hundredfold, I've, I've said it before, you can always give it to me. Because I can find something to do with your hundredfold if you don't want to use what God gives you there. And I'm sure there are other people here that can say the same thing. They'll take your hundredfold. If you want to be pious, well, I'd just rather be poor and, and ignorant, then we'll let you be both of those, and we'll be rich and smart. <laughs> well, I said 21 through 30 gives us the wanderings of David. Now, I'm going to put a map up here, a chart for you. That's rather detailed, so it'll probably take you a little time to get it down. But when we, we can end up with charts like this, it'll help you visualize things a lot better. I don't sit at home all day and, and play around coloring, but these things do uh, help you understand what's going on better. I have to admit I like making these up because they help me understand it when I can sit down and draw these things out. I've had several of you offer to do these for me, but... I just couldn't do it myself because I changed so many things from what the map or the book has and I wouldn't be able to communicate all that to you. Whenever we get to eschatology, we'll have a lot of these drawn up so you can see where uh, millennium and raptures and, and uh, antichrist and Israel and everything fits in there. Well, this is an account of these chapters that we've been looking at going on through chapter uh, 30 of David's wandering. Uh, you just began getting it down, it'll be impossible to get this off the tape, as you can tell. You'll have to get it down uh, now or never. Then I'll show you which way all the errors are supposed to go and where David goes. Uh, this is how I got A's in uh, science fair projects in Bible. Before I was saved, I had uh, the city's largest collection of bird nests and bird eggs in Memphis, and I won every contest I ever entered with my bird nest collection. But whenever I got saved, then I started drawing diagrams. And I remember drawing a diagram of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's colossal image in Daniel's four beasts over in Daniel 2, 7, and 8. And I won with uh, those charts there. Now we're going to start up here at the very top, right over here. See, there's a glare. We'll start at Gibeah. Gibeah is the red dot. And this we're going to work our way around... I believe until we get down here to Ziklag, we'll end up at Ziklag. David's wandering. So basically what we have here is a diagram of the southern portion of Palestine. Mediterranean Sea, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. We've got some important cities here. Gibeah, Ramah, Nob, Jerusalem, uh, let's see, this must be Bethlehem, Gath, Ziklag, uh, that should have an H in it, Apex, A-P-H-E-K, that should be A-P-H-E-K, the cave of Adullam, Keilah, Ziph, Carmel, Maon, Wilderness of Paran, and Gedi, and Moab. You can approximately get some of the cities down, then I'll, we'll trace it and I'll show you which way he goes. We don't have time to, to look at every verse here that corresponds with this, but you can find it in these chapters. It would take us too long to go through here. But this is where, this is David's official wandering. This is where he's going all around. Now, if you've got a question about any of these actions, Okay, that's in Gedi, E-N-G-E-D-I. -E -E Three famous cities along the western side of the Dead Sea. Qumran was right here. That's where the Dead Sea scrolls were discovered, Qumran. In Gedi, and then the Fort Masada, where the last 
Jewish revolt held out in AD, year A.D. 70 before the Romans destroyed. That's been a TV movie, Masada. Masada is the other city down here. It's the southern, southwestern portion of the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. With an M right here, Mayon, M-A-O-N. Right above it is Carmel, C-A-R-M-E-L. Moab over here, Paran, Ziph, Keila, K-E-I-L-A-H, Adullam, so forth. Okay, you got your cities drawn? Okay, here's where we start. We start in Gibeah. This is Saul's hometown, and this is the capital in Israel right now, is Gibeah. Now, we've already seen David. You see, we passed some of these, I think. Uh, in chapter 19 and verse 18, David goes up to Ramah. Remember, that's where, that's, this is uh, Samuel's hometown. So he goes from Gibeah. I've got to make sure I know which direction he's going from Gibeah. He goes up to Ramah to see Saul. Then he comes back down to Gibeah, and this is when he visits uh, Jonathan for the last time. Then he goes from Gibeah over to Nob, N-O-B. Now, this is the place that Saul later destroys. Destroys the city and uh, four score and five priests in Nob. From Nob, he flees to Gath. This is the first time out of two times when he goes to Gath, which is a Philistine stronghold, and the king there is King Achish, A-C-H-I-S-H. -H. He meets up with King Achish at Gath twice. Then he flees from Gath to Adullam. Then he goes from Adullam. When he gets to Adullam, uh, Saul is informed that David is at Adullam, and he realizes that he's in a lot of trouble. So whenever he decides to leave Adullam, he takes his father and his mother with him. This is one of the times we see his father and his mother. He gathers his father and his mother up, and he goes this long journey all the way over to Moab, and he asks the king of Moab to watch after his father and mother while he's fleeing from Saul. Now you say, well, why would Moab do something like that? Well, it's because a lot of the enemies around Israel at this time, including the Philistines and the Moabites, saw, king, saw David as being a direct enemy to the nation of Israel and to King Saul. Because they saw him as being an enemy against Saul, then they thought he was an enemy against Israel. Therefore, on two occasions, the Philistines were ready to help him, and on one occasion, the Moabites were ready to watch after his father and his mother for him. Then he comes from Moab back up to this region. It's not a city, it's a forest. I don't have the name of it written down here, but you'll, we'll come across it sooner or later. But it's a forest. This area, uh, let's see, then from there, he goes over to Keilah. The Keilahites uh, deceive him later on and just about give him into the hands of Saul. So this is when he has to flee Let's see, he goes down to Ziph, Z-I-P-H. Then he goes down to Maon. Then he goes across to En Gedi. Various things taking place here in all these accounts. Then he goes down to the wilderness of Paran and stays down here for some time and gains the following of men down in the wilderness of Paran. Then we see him going back up to Carmel. This is, I believe, in chapter 25, where we have the husband and wife team, Nabal and Abigail. All of chapter 25 deals with him at Carmel. Then for the second time, he goes back to King Achish of the Philistines in the Philistine city of Gath. Then once he comes here for the second time, the king gives him the city of Ziklag, and David lives at Ziklag for, I think, a year and uh, four months. So he comes down here to the city of Ziklag. 
Then over in chapter 28, the Philistines are preparing to launch a final battle against Israel, which results in their defeat, as well as the death of Saul and his son. And to do this, all the Philistines travel up here to Aphek. That should be A-T-H-E-K. And David goes along with them. He's very wise and subtle in what he says. He appears as if he's willing to fight against Israel. But he knows in the last moment that he's not going to have to fight against his own brethren because that's something that, of course, David would never do. Twice he called Saul the Lord's anointed. And he said, I won't touch him. I'll let the Lord handle it. So then at the end of the book, whenever the Philistines go on from Aphek and fight against the Israelites, David returns from Aphek back down to Ziklag. That must be in chapter 30. And of course, there he finds the city's been destroyed. His two wives have been taken captive. And he goes and gets them back and comes back to Ziklag. And that's where we end up with him. Okay, do you have any questions on that? This is the wandering that he does. I'll leave that up there for a few more moments so you can get that down. We're over here in chapter 21. Now one thing to remember about chapters 21, question, several decades. We don't know exactly. But it takes up a lot of time. Because you see, we see him coming on the scene back there in the very beginning of Saul's reign. You see, Saul's only been reigning a little while whenever they have to fight that battle against Goliath. And David goes down there. That's just towards the beginning of Saul's reign. And then we see this going into the very end of his reign. We know that he had a reign of 40 years, even taking into account it's Bosheth, his son, who reigned several, seven years after him. Whatever the case, should still end up with several decades of him wandering. Okay, another thing to remember about chapters 21 through 30 is that this forms the historical background for many, many of the songs that David writes. Uh, this is, we're going to fit some of these in, not all of them, but a few of them, and you can find the rest of them yourself. But the psalms will make more sense to you when you fit them into the background of 1 Samuel uh, 21 through 30. Uh, we've actually seen one composed on the basis of chapter 19 uh, and verse 11. That's Psalm 59. But we see many, many more composed against this background, chapters 21 uh, through 30 of David's wandering in the wilderness. All right, chapter 21, we see him at Nob. He comes uh, to Nob, so you can follow along where we've gone. He's gone from Gibeah up to Ramah, then he came back to Gibeah, and now he goes down to Nob. <clears throat> now, Nob is a rare city in the Old Testament as far as its frequency of appearance. I think only about, oh, five or six or seven times does... Uh, this name even appear in scripture, Nob, so it's not a very significant place. However, at this time, the tabernacle is located at Nob, and this is why David is going, is going down there to Nob. Now remember back earlier in the book, whenever the Philistines attacked Shiloh, Shiloh was completely destroyed at that time, which we even know that from archaeological soundings and findings. And as a result, the Ark of the Covenant, once it had been sent back from the Philistines, was sent to Kirjath Jearim. And there it stayed for years and years. But that doesn't mean that the tabernacle and the Ark now are in the same place. We've got a division here. The tabernacle and all the other instruments are at Nah. The Ark of the Covenant is the only thing that we find over at Kirjath Jearim. David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place and so forth. And this is the account that Jesus mentioned uh, concerning the Sabbath day, whenever David was actually allowed to eat the sacred bread, 
because it was for the reason of necessity here that he had to have something to eat. So this is the historical background for that. Uh, let's see. We come down to verse 10. And this, you see, we go from Nob here down to Gath. And this is what we see in verse 10. David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Now, at the first, whenever David comes there, they are afraid of him simply on the basis of the song that's sung that David has slain his 10,000. So as a result, it appears that they actually are going to kill David at this time. So what does he do? Verse 13, he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his fiddle fall down upon his beard. So he acts like a lunatic here just to save his own neck, of course. Now, let's go over to uh, Psalm 34. You see, this is the background for Psalm 34. This is when he composed Psalm 34. Was in commemoration of his deliverance whenever he acted like a madman. You see, you probably didn't know that. Now look in the title of Psalm 34, a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. Now Abimelech, remember, was just uh, a title for the kings of the Philistines, but his actual name was Achish, which you get in your margin. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So forth. The last verse, the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Now he sings that because of his deliverance that he has back here in 1 Samuel 21, uh, verses 10 through 15. Also Psalm 56, this goes right along with it, Psalm 56. To the chief musician upon Jonath Elam Rekokim, Mictam of David, when the Philistines took him in Gath. So it's the same thing. Your title is Psalm 56. Psalm 34, Psalm 56. Composed in uh, commemoration to this. Okay, in chapter 22. Verse 1, David departed thence, escaped to the cave of Adullam. So here he goes from Gath, now down here to the cave of Adullam. Huge cave still there today. We know which one it is. I've seen it before because it could hold four or five hundred men in this one cave. So it's a huge thing. Then in chapter 22, what we have is Saul's destruction of the priests and the city of Nob. Now, let's look at several psalms that are based historically upon 1 Samuel 22. First of all, we tie together 1 Samuel 22 and verse 1 with Psalm 57. We just sang that psalm tonight, Psalm 57. David wrote it when he was in the cave of Adullam. Psalm 57, to the chief musician al Tashish Miktam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. And then he says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Does that sound like someone that's in trouble? <laughs> Not on your life. He knew how to get out of caves when he was back into them like that. Just write, sit down and start writing psalms like that. So he says in verse 7, My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Oh. Then as if he was a little sluggish, he says, Awake, my glory, awake, sultry in heart, I myself will awake early. So he decided it was time to put off the spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. Oh. Then Psalm 142 was also composed here. We're just giving you a whole ton of information tonight. I can tell. <laughs> Mass seal of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. 
Verse 5, I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. He wasn't confessing, you know, that he was going to die early or anything like that. He said, I'm going to stay in the land of the living. Then, uh, let's see, let's, I believe we've got another one. Uh, yes, chapter 22 and verse 5. This is when the prophet Gad first comes on the scene and tells him that he's to leave now the cave of Adullam. And, or no, this is after he's gone to Moab already. Uh, let's see. Yeah, verses, verse 3 and 4. We see him taking his mother and father down to Moab. 1 Samuel 22, verses 3 and 4. Then in verse 5, Gad tells him it's not best to remain in Moab, and he goes back up to the wilderness of Judah. Uh, there's the name of that forest, the forest of Herod. In verse 5, all right, this is where we go on our map. He's been over here in Moab, so this is when he comes back around the southern end of the Dead Sea, and he comes back to this general area. There was some particular forest of Herod here. This is where David ends up again. A forest on the edge of a wilderness region there. Okay, we tie that in with Psalm 63. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now this is the same time because it says there that he departs to the wilderness of Judah. Evidently you've got a forest on the edge of a wilderness. As I said, so he writes, this psalm, very famous psalm in his praise. Let's see, we go on down to verse 9. Those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. And did you think King Saul was, was saved in the final analysis around here? Well, he wasn't. That's the answer to it right there. He said, those that seek my soul will go to the lowest parts of the earth. That is, the bad part of Theo. Saul, of course, certainly wasn't a regenerate man. Some Christians evidently feel like he was, but I don't know where they get the idea when it clearly says God took his spirit from him and gave him an evil spirit. Uh, that's the same as calling him unregenerate. Then shall fall by the sword, and they shall be a portion for foxes, but the king shall rejoice in God. You see, he's prophesying about himself here in the future. The king shall rejoice in God, and every one that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Let's see, do we have another one? Uh, yes, 22 and verse 9. You see, we've got a lot of psalms based on 1 Samuel 22. 1 Samuel 22 and verse 9. This is when Saul is looking for someone to befriend him. And Doeg, his Edomite herdsman, uh, helps him. And uh, Psalm 52 is the result of this. To the chief musician Maschil, a psalm of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said unto him, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Verse 8, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God, and I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. You see how he's so thankful to what God has called him? Doesn't have anything wandering all around here. But we, you know, the average Christian thinks that David was sitting in his parlor, eating grapes, writing these songs. And these were written out of great em emotional turmoil that he had and having to always be fleeing from his enemies for years and years. He wasn't sitting being fanned by someone writing these songs. Any of us could write a psalm then. But it's a different thing whenever you're being chased by your enemy to be able to sit down and write these beautiful pieces of psalmistry and poetry and just thanking God that he's faithful and thanking him for the victory and thanking him for his name and always praising him. Oh, that's something different here. And most Christians under the new covenant can't come anywhere near overcoming what David had to overcome under the old covenant. And that's why he gets to be such a great type of Christ, one of the greatest types of Christ in the Bible. Because he's one who always knew how to trust in God, regardless of what the circumstances were. And when he missed it, he was always faithful to repent whenever he missed it and get back right with God. Well, we can just go on and on. Chapter 23, we have David among the Keilites. Finds out from God that the Keilites are going to deliver him into Saul's hand, so he has to flee from them. 
verse 19. 2319 is the basis for Psalm 54. Let me go see what that title says. Psalm 54. The chief musician upon Neginoth Maschil, a psalm of David. When the Ziphim came and said to Saul, Doth not David hide himself with us? I think the Ziphim betrayed David twice, but here is one of the accounts. That's Psalm 54. Now you see in the end of Psalm, or 1 Samuel 23, David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at Indian Gedi. So here we've actually got him going from Maon, where he'd been previously, over here to Indian Gedi. From Maon over to Indian Gedi, which you can tell the next step is he's going to be going down here to the wilderness of Paran. Chapter 24 is the first of two times where David spares Saul's life. He says, God forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointing. Because he was still the anointed king at that time. David hadn't officially and publicly been announced king, only privately anointed king, remember. But Saul himself went through a private anointing and then he went through a public anointing. David's gone through a private anointing and a public one will come later. But he's gone through this private anointing, but officially Saul is still king. Chapter 25, verse 1, Samuel, the prophet, dies. And then we have what's known as the folly of Nabal. Very interesting chapter, how his wife Abigail intercedes on her own behalf and tells David, as his name is, so is he. And his name means a fool. And she said, my husband's name is a fool, and he lives up to his name. Rather cruel for a wife to say of her husband? Well, it was true of old perverse Nabal here. And he ends up being smitten by God in a drunken stupor, and it says that his heart died in him. His heart actually died in him. I guess he had a heart attack or something and died. And David takes Abigail to wife. Now, he's got a sister named Abigail, too, but these are two different Abigails. David's got two sisters. I forget the other one's name, but one of them is Abigail, but he also has a wife named Abigail along with uh, Ahinoam. He marries Ahinoam and Abigail. So we've got two wives here in chapter 25. Chapter 26, David spares Saul's life for the second time. Well, let's see, we would have already passed going down here to Paran. We are, we're back up here to Carmel because this is where Nabal and Abigail lived was at Carmel. Now, the next thing we'll do, we'll go from Carmel back up to Gath, which is what we do in chapter 27. Chapter 27 is the second time that David flees to Agid, who is the Philistine king in Gath. So he's gone from Carmel now up to Gath. This is in chapter 27. In 28... Saul goes to the spiritualist medium of Endor. Now, Endor is not on the map, but they actually fight the battle at Mount Gilboa. And Mount Gilboa, which we'll read about in chapter 31, Mount Gilboa is way up here in northern Israel. It's off our map here. And Endor, the city of Endor, the little town of Endor where the spiritualist medium lives, is also up here near Mount Gilboa, which is up in northern Israel. That's why we got him drawn up this far to Aphek, because that's how far the Philistines go before the Lord of the Philistines finally tell Achish, we're afraid that once we get in the midst of battle, David will turn his back on us. So they ask Achish to send David back. That's when David comes back to Ziklag. So his confrontation here with the spiritless medium at Endor takes place in 28. Then in 29... Uh, this is where we have what I just said. The Philistine lords don't want David to fight with them. Now, Achish tells him in verse 9, he said, you've been just like an angel of God to us. But because the majority of the Philistine lords do not want David's presence along with them when they fight Israel, then Achish has to succumb to their desire and therefore send David back to Ziklag. You following all this? I know we're giving you a lot. We're going fast. We're just about through here. We had a lot to get in here on these last few chapters. 
short chapter 29 but this is the the uh, situation that takes place here uh, well let's see I guess we got time to mention something else we're gonna have to go back earlier was that um, well I don't remember where that was now anyway I don't remember where it is now, but anyway, whenever David is here at Ziklag, what he is doing is going down south here and finding all the enemies of Israel. And what it appears like to Achish, and what David in a roundabout way leads him to believe is that he's going and fighting against the Israelites. And Achish really likes that, that he's going and fighting against the Israelites, while the whole time David is going down here and fighting against the enemies of Israel. Like I said, I don't remember where that is now. I had it marked, but I don't see it in my notes or here in the Word now. 27 what? Verse 9. Okay, go back to verse 8. That's it. 27, 8. David and his men. You see, chapter 27 now. It's the second time he goes to Gath. David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites and the Gezrites and the Amalekites, for those nations were of old the inhabitants of the land, as thou, as thou goest to Shur, even unto the land of Egypt. Remember, Hagar is the one who went on the way to Shur, which we know Shur led down south and led towards the land of Egypt. So he is fighting people down here. David smote the land, left neither man nor woman alive, and took away the sheep, the oxen, the asses, the camels, the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. And Achish said, Whither had ye made roads today? And David said, Against the south of Judah. Now he didn't, you see how he phrases it here, against the south of Judah. He doesn't mean against Israelites, but against the territory south of Judah. He words it in such a way that he can get by with it, and so forth. Yeah, those are the verses I was looking for. So he gets on good standing with Achish, king and Gath of the Philistines. In chapter 30, David's hometown at this time is still Ziklag, a Ziklag where his wife, and the wives and children of all of his men live is completely destroyed by none other than the Amalekites. You see, there are always is a problem here. Whenever David, you see, David has been up here at Aphek the whole time, and they've left his wife and children and the wives and children of all of his men down here in Ziklag. When he gets back, he finds the whole city's been burned with fire. All of his, all the wives and all the children have been taken captive. Uh, the chapter goes on to say how they went after the men that took them, came upon them, and defeated most of them. I think some of them rode off on camels, but they, uh, yeah, 400 men, it says, fled, rode off on camels, but they took care of most of them. Then in verse 25, we have a certain statute and principle that begins in Israel, which David, with his magnanimous self was likely to do but which his men didn't like too much and that is whenever we go out to fight we're going to leave certain men behind those that are fearful or those <clears throat> that are tired or those that we just want to watch the city or watch the camp for us we'll go out and fight but whenever we come back we'll make an even distribution of all the spoils that's the only sensible thing to do to keep everyone happy and it tells us in verse 35 25 and it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. That even the people that stayed behind also got to enjoy some of the spoil because they stayed behind, if for no other reason, to protect the city. Verses 26 through 31 are real interesting because here David, it says, sends prizes and money and clothing and everything to all types of small cities here in southern uh, Palestine, verse 31, anywhere where he himself or his men were wont to halt, that is, wherever they had been before, and what he's already doing ahead of time is preparing the way for his kingship. He's gaining popular appeal from everyone because he's going out fighting all the battles. They know that he's a fugitive and a vagabond as far as King Saul is concerned, 
But whenever he goes out and fights, he always sends the spoil back to these people here and these people here and some other people here. Makes them real happy with David. Therefore, whenever it's time to make him king, all of southern Israel is ready to go with him. We end with chapter 31, which is the disastrous defeat of Saul and his three sons at Mount Gilboa. And if you want some homework, then you can compare the last chapter of 1 Samuel with the first chapter of 2 Samuel and see how can you reconcile the two. Do we have any questions on that? I'm going to turn this chart off. I assume that you're through with that. Well, no, that should keep you busy just studying that until uh, I don't know when. <laughs> Amen. Well, I was just thinking of the one particular message here. That'll take you a while to study that. Oh, they're not. Well, why did they go? Why did he go to Moab? You see, the Moabites look at him as being an enemy. And that's why he's allowed to go to Moab. That's why he's allowed to go to the Philistines. They look at him as being an enemy of Israel, and an, he is official enemy of Israel and of King Saul. So he, that's why he's allowed to go there. They don't say anything about it. They like him there at first because he tricks them into thinking that he's fighting against Israel for them. It's just later on they discover, or later on the Philistine lords become suspicious of him once they actually get in a pitched battle, that he'll turn his back on them and fight for Israel, and they'll have to fight on two fronts, and they'll be surrounded. Well, yeah, that's a literal coming back, but um, it's a literal coming back, but doesn't mean that it's allowed. You know, you've got, you've got participation in the onslaught there, but God actually does allow Samuel to come back. Yeah. That's what it says, what the text says. Oh, and that he was fasting? Yeah. Yeah, well, you see, they're preparing for this, this big battle here. So he's got quite a emotional turmoil going on with him and in him about this big battle they're fixing to fight. But like, uh, in many cases with these kings of Israel, they are very distinct. If they fast and they can humble themselves, then they Well, see, he, that's the same thing as they're taking the ark into the battle back in uh, chapter 4 of 1 Samuel. That's the, he thinks superstitiously that his fast is going to help him in some way or that his uh, consultation with the old prophet Samuel is going to help him in some way. He's not trusting in the Lord, though, because it says there in chapter 28 that God ceased speaking to him by dreams and by the Urim and Tumim and by the prophets. Therefore, he became very, very scared. I mean, he's petrified in, in 1 Samuel 28, and that's why he goes to see if they can't conjure up Samuel. But no, he was a renegade and a reprobate individual, unregenerate. So it didn't matter how long he fasted, God would never have heard that. Because you see, you've already got two formal rejections of him from being king. Sometimes God in his mercy in later Israelite times would listen to some of the kings. You can hardly find a perfectly good king. Well, none of them are perfectly good. We see blemishes and flaws in all of them. But sometimes he would overlook that and help them whenever they fasted, uh, like Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat allied himself with the northern kingdom twice during his reign. But whenever they fasted there in 2 Chronicles 20, he still listened to him, though. But he, of course, basically was a good king. 
whereas Saul in, in every way is disobeying God and trying to kill the very man that God has chosen to be the next king. So in other words, however long he fasted would have been uh, beside the point. God wouldn't have listened to him. Pardon? Yeah, he's of course missing it everywhere he turns. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, uh, the amount of wives that David had, was that one of his mistakes? Oh, that was a mistake, yeah. That was not allowed at that time? No. No, not allowed. That wasn't, that wasn't God's best for him. And in the account, we didn't stop and look at him, but there were uh, several places there where he does tell a lie. There are most of the places uh, he simply doesn't say all that he knows and it doesn't constitute a lie. But in one place there where he said that um, uh, when he goes to Nob and Ahimelech, the priest there, says, you know, is afraid that he comes. And he said, the king has sent me here on business. As far as we know, that's a lie because Saul never sent him there on any business. That's a lie. That would have been wrong there. Why are we seeing Israel because of Ephraim and Judah those are the two great tribes and you've already got jealousy they started long you know before this between the tribe of Ephraim which was in northern Israel and the tribe of Judah and it's the jealousies between those two tribes that caused the division yes what chapter are you talking about Oh, yeah, probably just a localized battle there. Uh, we're told back in uh, earlier, I think in chapter 8, that uh, once they defeated the Philistines, uh, they came to more at Israel forever, practically. But that just meant for a long period of time because they're always fighting against the Philistines, just localized there. Philistines. Uh-huh. Um, and they were smote by God. Uh-huh. It says in, in chapter 5 and verse 12, with Amorites. Uh-huh. Also in the curse in Deuteronomy 28. Are they talking about Amorites? We don't really know what they're talking about. <laughs> some have said that. Some have just said some other type of, it's some type of boil uh, or something like that, which is, similar to what uh, hemorrhoids are, but whether that's exactly what it is, we don't know. But they're also smitten with a plague at this time, something similar to the uh, bubonic plague, because they make the five golden mites, or rats, what they really were, rats, because they said rats were in the land. And of course, rats are the ones that carry the insects that carry the bubonic plague. For a complete list of brothers